Thank you for joining us both live and via live stream. My name is Patrick Lyons and I am director of the Arizona State Museum. As many of you know, the Arizona State Museum and the University of Arizona are situated on land that has been home to indigenous peoples for at least 13,000 years. Today, Tucson is home to the Tahana Atam and the Pascua Yaqui. And there are currently 22 federally recognized tribes with ancestral lands in Arizona. Thanks to a grant from the Mellon Foundation, tonight's program is the second of three we are presenting this year, all about and in partnership with indigenous photographers. The grant has also allowed us to purchase photographs by our featured artists and others in order to strengthen and expand ASM's photographic collections. We have had the great fortune to purchase four prints from tonight's featured artist, and we are very grateful to the Mellon Foundation for making this possible. These purchases are among the first of what we hope will be many acquisitions of contemporary photography by indigenous artists. If you would like to contribute to this effort, please come and see me after the program. Your help will be much appreciated. So uh, now I will turn it over to Janelle Weekly, manager of ASM's photographic collections, and she will introduce tonight's speaker. Good evening. So during the process of doing research to find indigenous photographers, I met this lovely woman from the Tahana Atam Community College, Anne Marie uh, Stevens. And she said, do you want me to post something on Facebook about this? And I was like, sure, <laughs> that would be great. Well, she did. And I, I'm pretty sure within minutes, <laughs> I got an email from Augustine or a phone call and he sent me images and I thought, oh my gosh, we have to, we have to have these in our collection. And I reached out to him. We had several conversations and here we are. Um, Augustine is a man of service. He has served the Pascua Yaqui Nation and the Tahana Atam Nation as a police officer. He served our country as a sergeant and was in the Iraq war for two tours of duty. And now while working on a bachelor's degree at the University of Arizona in fine art and indigenous studies, he is serving the broader community through his work, which is informing us about the issues of murdered missing indigenous people and the travesty of Indian boarding schools. We are really glad to be able to feature him and his work tonight. And so please help me welcome Augustine. Um, thank you for that introduction on my service. Uh, I was a former police officer back in 1999 at the Taunton Police Department. And in, I had transferred to the Pascoyaki Police Department, which is my uh, home reservation where I was, uh, grew up at. And um, I decided to serve my people as a police officer. Uh, during this time, I decided uh, when 9-11 had happened, I decided that I wanted to do something bigger for myself and for my country. So I volunteered to, to go to, into service and was stationed in Hawaii in um, 2004. Uh, not even months, I was already deployed to Iraq. I did two tours in 04, 05, 07, 08 as a 88 Mike truck driver. Um, my sole purpose there was convoy security. Um, the reason why I tell you this is because I believe that, you know, in, in my, where I come from and, and being the warrior that, the war society that we're from as the Yaqui Nation, um, we want to defend the ones that cannot defend themselves, the ones that can ha not ha help themselves. And I feel that it's my duty to do that. Um, I was medically disabled in 2010. So I was forced retired medically uh, due to uh, post-traumatic stress disorder. So I've been retired since 2010 and now I decided to come back to school. Uh, I came to the University of Arizona, uh, decided to do art. I wanted to do painting and drawing, but photography has really caught my eye because I wanted to capture the emotions in people. I wanted to capture people 
in their natural state and and just show life as it is especially throughout you know during the times of war and after war and now what's going on now you know i just wanted to to create emotions of what was going on uh, so now i work with uh my photography is based on missing and murdered indigenous women but now i'm i'm incorporating the boarding school epidemic because it's two epidemics that are going on in tribal nations in our in our country and in canada australia and new zealand and around the world so i felt that that i can become an advocate and a voice for the people that are that don't have one and i can be the the healing for the survivors and i can breathe the prayers for the the families and basically that's what I stand for is to help the families and the survivors and also to find justice for the victims. So before I start, I wanted to talk about a current issue that's really uh, happening now. It's called uh, the Indian Child Welfare Act. Um, I come from the Indian Child Welfare Act. I was placed in foster care back when I was 11 years old, back in 1986. And I stayed in foster care until I was 19. Um, I believe that coming into the ICWA system, which uh, the ICWA system is, was a, an act to keep Native children with Native families and Native communities. So they will not lose their identity, their culture, their traditions. Um, so in recent times in Texas, a lawsuit has been brought upon to the Supreme Court. Um, and now they want to abolish the ICWA uh, Act which is something that, you know, I really am against because if I didn't stay in my community or with my people and not kept my traditions and, and kept my ceremonies alive and I was placed in a non-native home, I would not, I would lose my uh, identity completely. I wouldn't know who I am and I might not even succeed in a system. Um, that was outside my community that I was used to for 11 years as a child. So the Supreme Court has, as of November night, that's heard arguments and hopefully, and I pray that, that they do not abolish the ICWA, um, especially for the children now, especially in our times because it is gonna erase their identity. And that brings me to the boarding school epidemic. Um, in the boarding school epidemic back in, in, this, in the 1800s, it was made to assimilate natives into boarding schools and basically cut their identity, cut their language, cut their uh, traditions, culture, and make them what is mainstream society, non-native society. And hearing about the unmarked graves and the history of the boarding school, I kind of started thinking about the ICWAG you know, it's kind of like repeating history over again. It's trying to erase the identity of the native. And it's, it's taking that culture and the traditions that we're used to away from us. We're already losing our language, you know, and we need to bring that back through our communities. But, you know, ICWA and boarding school is, is to me, it's pretty much identical. So the boarding school started, well, the ICWA Act, um, I didn't go into this slide, but the ICWA Act started in 1978. And like I said, it was for keeping Native children in Native communities and with their Native people. Uh, prior to this, 75 to 80% of Na Indian families living off the reservation lost at least one child to the foster care system. Uh, ICWA has always been successful since it started and always kept the Indian children rights protected. Um, the Hanlon versus Bracken uh, lawsuit is the, the one that's in the Supreme Court now. And they're questioning the Tenth Amendment, which is federal uh, jurisdiction over state jurisdiction. And that's unlawful, and that's the argument. Um, so like I said, um, the Indian Child Welfare Act was discussed by the Supreme Court on November 9th. So hopefully soon, after this new year, we can find out what the outcome is to this. Um, 
To talk about the boarding school epidemic, uh, Richard Pratt, uh, Colonel Pratt, um, wanted to, to create schools to assimilate Native children. And he came up with a model called Save the Indian, Kill the Man. And his goal was to accomplish assimilation and it adopted the new policy of boarding schools where Indian children will be forcibly taken from their homes and enrolled into schools to kill the Indian to save the man. He was the architect and the philosopher and was a former Indian fighter. And he was one of the first schools that was built in the boarding school epidemic. Uh, so with this slogan, I decided to create a photo, um, part of the silent distress and you know, I, I used the slogan, just kill the Indian. And I used my son as um, one of my um, sources, you know, one of my, you know, persons to be a part of this photo because, you know, he's in school now and I wanted to show, you know, his age group. And I put an upside down uh, American flag. Uh, in war, uh, when I first went to Iraq, they told us that we were going to be in small post and that we weren't going to have uh, as much um, a backup power or backup units to reach us. And it would take about an hour or two. So they told us that in order for us to, to survive, if we were to be overrun, we were to hang an upside down flag, which signaled the distress signal, meaning that our base is being overrun and we need help. And a lot of people, um, when I first did this photo, a lot of my soldiers called me and said, why do you have an upside down flag in your photos? Are you, you don't love your country? And I go, it has nothing to do with that. I go, Natives has been using this symbol since the beginning, since they were put in reservations as putting an upside down flag for a distress. Because back in the reservation era, they had low conditions, uh, bad conditions, poverty, no food, nothing and they were basically dying. So they put the flag upside down to show distress. So I wanted to use that in this photo as part of the boarding school epidemic. Um, the boarding schools, uh, I wanted to show this map because Arizona was, is, was ranked number two in boarding schools. They had a total of 51. Uh, Oklahoma had a total of 83. And uh, 73 of these schools still remain. And like I said, Arizona is ranked number two. And these are the, 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 the church denominations that were in charge of these schools. Um, as you know, that a lot of these schools um, were very, uh, there was a lot of physical sexual abuse uh, among um, the fathers and the children. So it created a lot of intergenerational problems, uh, especially the ones that did survive the schools and went back home. Um, they had a lot of trauma that they never worked through, a lot of things that they couldn't, you know, they didn't know how to, to react or how to feel, how to think, um, which I will talk about um, in a little bit. So the U.S. launched uh, an investigation on native boarding schools. It all started in, in Canada at the Caloups Indian Residential School, where 215 uh, bodies were found, children, in unmarked graves. Um, and what it did is it, it helped us in the U.S. launch an investigation. Here in the U.S., uh, when we first started, um, they found, they, they decided to study 53 unmarked and marked graves, and in those graves, 19 of those boarding schools, five, over 500 American children were found. Um, and what they're doing now is they're trying to identify where these children came from, who their families are, and, and it's going to take a long process to find justice for these kids. Um, and the consequences, uh, Deb Hanlon, who is the Secretary of Interior, uh, came, um, quoted this, the consequences of federal Indian boarding school policies, including the intergenerational trauma caused by the family separation and cultural eradication inflicted upon generations of children as young as four years old, are heartbreaking and undeniable. Um, 
when we talk about this and uh, what, when she said this is the effects did not end at the boarding school. The effects came back to the reservation uh, as the children got older, the abuse that they, they incurred, um, they began to become the abusers and it created a generation of, of dysfunction in the homes. Um, alcoholism was a part of it. Um, nowadays it's drug addiction. Uh, people didn't want to talk about residential schools and till this day a lot of them do not want to talk about residential schools. So it's, it's very hard to, to try to find a solution to, to healing, but that's what us as Native people and Native nations and communities and our leaders in our tribal governments need to come up and see how we can start the healing process, especially in breaking the cycle of addiction, breaking the cycle of violence, breaking the cycle of abuse. And these are the things that we need to look into. And, and that's what we want to create, especially, that's why I do the work I do is because I want to make people aware of what's going on. And the more awareness that I spread or you guys spread or anyone else spreads, it would help the person to talk about their stories. And that's what we need is the stories and for them to heal. And we want them to heal. Um, this photo was done on a large format film, uh, four by five. I decided to do triple exposure underneath a blanket of an upside down flag with, uh, with an image of a person underneath trying to fight his way out of the, the system that they were placed in. And these are other photos that I wanted to include into the boarding school epidemic. Okay. Um, like I said, with the boarding school epidemic, it's it's right now it's in the beginning stages of data collection and and also investigation of unmarked graves. Uh, so it's barely in the early stages of of investigation. Uh, as soon as we get more info, I would add it more into my presentations, and more publications will be coming out regarding these issues in the future. Uh, the next topic that that my project project is based on is also about the indigenous women, uh, the missing and murdered indigenous women epidemic. Um, I have stats here, but there are, they are from 2016. Uh, the Urban Indian Health Institute uh, did a study of 71 urban cities um, in the United States, and they came up with the final report. Uh, back in 2016, a total of 5,712 missing and murdered indigenous women uh, were, were collected and, and put into a data system. That's 5,712. And that was since, I believe the time frame is from the 70s until 2016, 1970 to 2016. Uh, women are experience violence in their lifetime. That's 84.3% of women that experience violence in their lifetime, which is 10 times higher. That 10 times, which is, the women's murder rate is 10 times higher uh, than the national average. And Native women are two and a half times more likely to be victimized. Um, just to talk about the symbology of um, the missing and murdered indigenous women. The red handprint around, across the mouth uh, represents the silence of the victims. The silence of the victims meaning not knowing where the victims are or if they're still alive or, or if they're needing help, but it's just the silence. It's a, it's a, universal, it's a universal symbol that the MMIW uh, epidemic has been using. The red dress represents women, uh, and red shirts represent the men. The color red is used, it's part of our medicine wheel, and it is used because we believe as Native nations that the color red is the only thing that spirits can see. 
and they come back to us when we wear red or if we display red that the spirits are always next to us their spirit and also there is a red feather that represents uh, the survivors of the MMIW uh, epidemic So again, with more stats, uh, American Indian and Alaskan Natives, four out of five experienced violence in their lifetime. 1.7 times are more, more likely than white women to experience violence in the last year. And more than half experienced sexual violence in their lifetime. And murder rates are more than 10 times the national average. And this is under the NCIA.org. Uh, uh, you can also find this in um, the Urban Indian Health Institute and the Sovereign Bodies. Uh, uh, websites. Uh, native youth on some reservations, 43% uh, are single mother households, and native children are less than 1% in the U.S. population, and 2.1 are in the foster care population. In 2016, again with the uh, the Urban Indian Health Institute, they did. Uh, the rankings of states. Arizona was ranked number three with a total of 54 missing and murdered indigenous women. And the state and the city of Tucson was ranked four in the state, in the nation with 31 missing and murdered indigenous. Um, this comes from a report, the final report done, conducted by the Arizona State University. Uh, it was concluded in 2020. And the factors in, in the, what I want to say about uh, the factors of uh, intergenerational trauma was basically the, the history of what we have gone through, the colonization, the genocide, the cultural assimilation, systematic racism, uh, interpersonal violence, and, and then what's going on now is it's the reporting systems with the missing and murdered indigenous women. Um, as you can see, um, uh, in 2016, I told you there's a total of 54 missing and murdered in Arizona. With this final report, it turns out that there's 160 missing and murdered indigenous women in this state, which really puts us at the top of the rankings of missing and murdered. As you can see below the 160, those are the, the increasing rates from year to now, and it keeps rising. And um, just to let you know that the day of action and the day of uh, missing and murdered indigenous is May 5th, uh, coinciding with Cinco de Mayo. Uh, and uh, that's just some stats that, uh, that are just coming out from that 2020 report. Um, during COVID, it had to stop because of you know the COVID and it's, it, it halted everything. So now ASU is starting back on doing research again and creating more publications on this issue. And right here, I wanted to talk about the men. Um, there's really not a lot of uh, data on the men yet, um, which they are working on, especially on uh, how many are missing and murdered. Um, but it does state that the vast majority, 68% of missing American Indians and boys and men, uh, there's 68%, which is close to, to women. 2.75% uh, of all Indian homicide victims are male, according to the CDC. And nearly identical percentage of male and female Native Americans have experienced an intimate partner violence in their lifetimes. 81% uh, males and 84.3% in females, according to the DOJ. And more male Native Americans have experienced psychological aggression by an intimate partner in their lifetimes and 72% of males and 66% of females. Male victims had, the high, it had a high homicide rate of three times higher than the female victims. Uh, their median age was 32. Uh, one out of two victims lived in the city. Um, you know, a lot of natives do live in the city because the the relocation act that occurred in the 70s, oh, in the 30s, 
where they took natives off the reservation to work in the, to the cities and basically put them into a, a, an environment they were, they were not used to, uh, especially coming from the reservation. It was a whole different world. And a lot of this, um, a lot of people did stay in the city, but it, a lot of the missing and murdered indigenous are coming, and the data is coming from, from people that were off the reservation, uh, especially with human trafficking that is going on. Um, and there is a lot. We live about an hour away from the Nogales, Sonora, and there is a lot of human trafficking coming in and out, uh, especially going into Mexico. The problems with the data collection is, the first problem is that the current law enforcement simply doesn't have the database to input or to even look at the, the data information on missing and murdered. Uh, many urban police departments are not tracking crimes against Native Americans. Many databases did not contain simple option for Native Americans. So they will mi misclassify them as other or Hispanic Latino heritage. Um, the second problem we faced is that Arizona lacks any standards for tracking or collaborating across jurisdictions uh, to locate missing indigenous women. And this is one thing that, that comes into play is the sovereignty. Um, Native Americans on the reservation are a sovereign nation, which means that they, they create their own laws, they manage their own. Um, basically, it's their own little city. Um, if a police officer from the Tucson Police Department wants to go in and, and serve a warrant on a native on the reservation, they cannot do it without extradition processes. Um, back in, I believe about five years ago, the Violence Against Women's Act, um, which uh, basically states that a non-native can only be arrested for domestic violence or assault. Uh, in 2022, they reorganized that act and now we can prosecute, tribal jurisdictions can prosecute non-natives in tribal court, state court, or federal court on crimes of murder, sexual abuse, um, domestic violence. So they're starting to add more laws where it's giving tribal um, courts power to, to arrest um, uh, non-natives on the on the reservation. Back when I was a police officer, I couldn't arrest a non-native. I had to just drive them off the reservation and let them go. And then do some extradition paperwork, which most of the time did not go through the court system. Or it was pushed down. So that was a problem that I had to go through when I was uh, a police officer. So it's I'm glad that the, the Violence Against Women's Act is in place and they're starting to look at that more. Um, but it's only for women. It's not, it does not talk about men also. So now I'm gonna talk about the work that I, when I first started this work, I was, um, I was just, one day I was looking at YouTube and there was a 16-year-old uh, female, her name was Brianna Johnny, from Canada. And she had wrote, written a book called, If I Go Missing. And she had a YouTube uh, documentary and video. And it basically, the book talks about what happens if I go missing. Is anybody gonna go out and find me? Is there anybody that's gonna care? And if I do, if my body is found, she asked that she be buried in a red dress. So it was a whole book about the missing and murdered indigenous in Canada. Um, like I said, it's the, the movement did start in Canada, but now it's, it moved to the United States where we're doing our own investigations. But the thing with this 16 year old being so brave, she wrote a letter to the premier in Canada and told him, if I go missing, what are you gonna do? Asking him. And so I started thinking like, wow, man, if it's happening over there and they're not doing nothing about it, what are they doing here? So I decided to create this project called the Silent Red Dress. 
And the silent red dress was just basically the symbols of the movement. I wanted to create what the symbols meant. I wanted to put them in photos and just basically start the awareness in the missing and murdered indigenous epidemic. And I started working on this project and what I did is I just started creating photos. I started asking people if they wanted to come and model, uh, be a part of my project. And many of them did. And many of them had relatives that were missing and murdered. So it was very emotional to, to talk to them about their story and then take their photo with the emotion that they still had inside. So the first photo here, I wanted to show the reflection of what's going on now to the reflection of the past how the past is relieve, reliving itself again. Because in the past, they wanted to make us invisible. They wanted to get rid of us. They wanted to erase us. And that's what's going on with the missing and murdered, is that we're becoming invisible because, not because, you know, yes, because they're ta being taken away, but because the government, our government, has not worked hard enough to help us in solving these crimes. You know, like I said, there's the Savannah's Act, there's uh, Lady Justice. These are all um, what presidents have signed, but only for data collection. It doesn't talk about task force. As a police officer, when I was certified, I was certified as an officer with tribal, uh, for tribal laws, and also I was an officer of the state, which means I was a state certified, AZ Post state certified officer meaning that I was cross-certified. And the solution that I wanted to talk about is why can't they just get one tribal officer from each tribe and one officer from each city tribe and create a task force to find these missing and murdered indigenous women. When a serial killer comes out, that's the first thing the FBI does. They get all these agencies together and create this task force. If we can't, if they can do that, we can do that in our level, in our tribal state, and, and with the federal's help, we can also do that. And these are the things that we all need to look at, especially our, you know, our, our justices, our lawyers, our, our courts, our tribal leaders need to look into trying to create this. And continue with the Red Dress Project, I, Wanted, like I said, it was all symbology. I wanted to bring out the dress uh, for the females, the, the red dress for the females, red shirts for the males. Uh, I wanted to use, uh, you know, I used Santa Maria Church on uh, one of them because I wanted to show the, the contrast between the church and its effects and the missing and murdered indigenous. So this was early in, in creating work. Um, and this was done about 2019. That's when I started this project. Um, the silent epidemic uh, is also the continuation of the symbology, but also including the, the uh, distress signal with the American flag. Um, I wanted to continue what I was doing, but I wanted to start questioning what the government was doing. Um, as an advocate, uh, I know that I can turn this into an activism piece, but that's not what I want. What I want is I want to create work that advocates to the people where we can create unity and solidarity in these issues, working with non-Indians, working with non-Native, uh, with non-Native agencies, law enforcement, uh, anyone who wants to get involved to try to figure out solutions for these issues. And and I believe that being an advocate is what I needed to be, especially with, with these two epidemics and other issues that are going on. So I continue to use the red hat print and the red dress um, with these projects. And I ended up creating this work. Um, this work, I was at home, and this is actually done at my house, and I decided to paint my walls with red handprints. I just started with red handprints just to show the, the symbol of the missing and murdered indigenous. And then at this time, that's when I was, uh, the mass graves of the boarding schools were coming up. So I started including that. 
So the first photo that I created was the one with myself and the feather covering my left eye. And that's basically a symbol of blind justice. That, that people are just seeing one, one, they're helping one side but not helping the other. And a good example is the Gabby Petito. And it was going on during the, this time when I was making this work. When Gabby Petito went missing, and it's a sad story, and, and I do have compassion for that story. But I was questioning, why is the media always showing people that are non-native? You know, we have a total of 5,712 missing and murdered indigenous women. How come I never heard that in the news? How come it doesn't come out? How come they don't talk about this? But when one non-Indian goes missing, why do they jump at that chance to cover that story? You know? And, and I just started questioning, like, you know, when I was in the military, they always told us we're all equal. You guys are all the color green because you guys are a brotherhood and you guys are gonna work together to help yourselves come home if you guys go to war. And that's what, that's what I was taught in the military. And, you know, I just, I started wondering why in the military they had that mentality but not out here. Why can't we be unified in helping each other um, in our state, in our cities, in our communities? Why can't we all work together? And, and if one goes missing, if an innocent child goes missing, why doesn't the media jump if it's a native child? They're important also. We're all important in this, in this state, in this city, in this country. We're supposed to be equal. And that's why I created this one, again, with the upside down flag. Um, like I said, the boarding school photo, um, I decided to incorporate both. Uh, the hands binded it was just an idea that, that, that I just came up with um, for the boarding school and for the missing and murdered indigenous children. And how America has our hand, hands tied because we're trying to find solutions, but they're not. They're trying to, you know, they're trying to collect data, but they're not creating task force. So I wanted to show the symbolic meaning of what they're doing to our children. They're keeping us prisoners. And, and that's what I wanted to look at. Um, you know, and it's just, I think it's one of the most powerful photos that I ever created in this project. And the last one was just, you know, a mother and child. And, uh, it's actually a photo of my wife and my son. And I wanted to use that as a reflection of, you know, the motherly love and the child that she's protecting in front of her. And the, red, uh, the, the handprint was the symbol of the missing and murdered. And, you know, I wanted to create, I wanted to add my family into these photos because I wanted to make it personal for me so I can feel what the families out there were feeling. If I was to lose my kids, how would I feel? And that's basically what I wanted to do with these photos, is to create that, that personal relationship, but also, you know, create a, just raise the question to our government. What more can you do for us? Raise the question to the media. What can you guys sh do for us to, to show the missing and murdered? Indigenous, indigenous women and men's and boys epidemic. You know, how can we all work together to, to try to solve these? Because the holidays are coming and a lot of people are gonna miss their, their loved ones because they are missing. And, you know, going through COVID the last two years, we lost a lot of loved ones, you know, due to a pandemic. And just imagine the people that you have lost. Just think about them. And how does that make you feel? Every day, natives go through that. Even if you're not related to them directly, you're related to them through the community. You're related to them through your culture. And they were there with you during those times. Just imagine that when they're not there. So. You know, I'm gonna leave you with, with this, is that the things we do in our lives, it's not about us, it's about the human. It's about the humanity and all things. 
And we need to keep that in mind because that's the things that we need in this country, especially what's going on with the political, the divisions. We need to bring that back. We need to bring the humanity back and being human back. And these are some links and um, some links that you can look at and write down if you want. And also I have some publications on the right that you can look at talking about all these issues in depth. Um, like I said, what I wanted to do is I wanted to create a presentation that shows what's going on with the epidemics, but also the artwork and why I became an artist. And that's all I got.